Welcome everyone to our uh, Franco Cardiovascular Center Innovation Webinar. We're so happy to have you all here. Uh, today we are going to have a talk about value assessment at Michigan Medicine and we have three wonder wonderful speakers joining us. Uh, Dr. Ganbari will introduce them in one moment. Uh, I do want to want to remind everyone that our next webinar will take place on de Wednesday, December 11th at 12 p.m. And it will be a Q&A session with Broadview Ventures and David Prim will be joining us. And the session will be moderated by Sarah Jamison Valencia from Innovation Partnerships. So we hope you can join us for that one as well. I will put a link to that in the chat momentarily. Um, all questions, um, please enter all questions in the Q&A and they will be answered after all of our uh, guests speak today. Um, and if you have any other questions, feel free to message me directly. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Ganbari to do some introductions. Thanks, Ashley. I'm so excited today because I, I feel like we're gonna finally talk about the most important topic that all every startup is concerned about is capturing some of the value that they create. And I can't think of um, no better people to talk about it today than the people that we have here today. Um, first um, is Carmen Carmichael, who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, on many different projects, Carmen. She has lots of experience, over 20 years of a procurement and contract management experience uh, in academic medical centers. She has lots of uh, experience in uh, negotiations, as I can attest to. Uh, particularly, she has deep knowledge of contract law, which is very helpful during those negotiations. She has a proven track, rec track record of identifying and implementing cost-saving initiatives and uh, standardization to accomplish system-wide level goals. She's uh, a wonderful resource for our institution for sourcing projects, project management, and uh, creating uh, you know cross-collaboration across teams to achieve the objectives of our institution. She will talk to us about the procurement process for cardiovascular products uh, at Michigan Medicine. Particularly, she'll start. She'll. Um, I'm hoping she will touch on and uh, delegation of authority, RFP process, and many, many other things, uh, not excluding supplier relationships here. Um, then we, we, I think um, you know, Mick Carmen, you want to go on, and I can just after that we'll I'll have a Pete and then uh, Nicole okay. Black. Welcome um, or for having me. Um, I've been a procurement agent at uh, University of Michigan for 21 years. It's been about 15 years in the cardiovascular medicine space. So I do both the uh, cardiac interventional side and the electrophysiology side. Um, so I get a lot of requests for contracting. So I thought that I would um, do sort of a, I'll go ahead and hold on a second, share screen. Um, I'll do a uh, brief overview of the process. I think everybody can see that. And so what I'm gonna do is give a very high level um, presentation on procurement. And then I'm gonna leave with you this quick start guide that will get you started or get you in the right direction of where you wanna go. Um, and then we'll also give you some things that you're supposed to do or what you're responsible for when you're putting in a request. And then finally, on the, the back of the presentation, we're just going to list the contact people that we have in procurement at the senior level. Um, every major um, area in the hospital has a senior procurement agent responsible for that area. And um, as mentioned, I have the cardiovascular center and the Department of Cardiology. So here's a quick buying guide, um, procurement process steps. Procurement is the act of obtaining a good or service. And that really fits pretty much everything that we do here outside of some niche products that or things that happen around the university, but pretty much everybody wants to buy or purchase a good or service. Um, procurement gets involved in the sourcing of your product or your good or service we also do negotiating to make the pricing more favorable. And we also select good and services that are best or the best fit for your department or for the physician. 
So there are six basic steps here. I'm not going to go through them all. I want to just hit the high points. But again, this will be provided to you as your little procurement cheat sheet. The first thing you, you usually are considering are what are your needs? What is it that you're looking for? And before you get to procurement, you kind of have to figure out what it is you're looking for. Are you looking for a good and, and are you looking for a service? Anything over $50,000 requires a competitive bid from the regions of the University of Michigan. So anything that requires a signature or is $50,000 annually, you have to come to your procurement person to get help with the procuring either the good or the service. If it is under 40, 49.99, um, you can work on your own, but be mindful. If you're gonna continuously use something year after year, you might, you're probably gonna hit that 50,000 threshold and need to get me involved. So just be mindful of that. So the regents of the university set that $50,000 limit so we can all be fair and reasonable in the marketplace. We are a state institution. We are Michigan constitutional corporation. Um, by law. So we want to follow the laws of Michigan, the state of Michigan, and we want to be fair and reasonable. We want diversity in our suppliers and the products that we use. And so the competitive bid process really allows us to do that. The other thing it really allows us to do is to figure out what pricing is. So when we send, send out a competitive bid, if you only have one supplier quoting, well, you only know what that particular commodity or service is. But when you send it out competitively, you get a lot of different suppliers and it gives you an idea of what the marketplace is actually paying or charging for that good or service. So you'll work with me or someone in the procurement office. We will decide if you need to do a competitive bid or if you can do a sole source. Again, I'm more favorable of the competitive bid for the reasons I stated. But sometimes you, you need a sole source and the sole source just says, hey, nobody else can provide this good or service and I'm going to give a document or a test to that. Um, so that's a whole nother process, but it is something that you can use for the appropriate times. Uh, I send that RFP or RFQ out to usually three suppliers in order to make it competitive. Uh, it can be more uh, up to like maybe five or six. But three is a good number to get an idea if the marketplace is fair and reasonable. So the, the suppliers send quotes uh, back to me. I do some data analytics and put all the quotes in, in some sort of summary format. And then I give them back to the stakeholders to review and discuss. And we have discussions after that. Sometimes it's an internal discussion just with your department administrator, your, your faculty partners, and then sometimes there's a complete, if it has to do with the entire organization, sometimes that stakeholder pool is larger. So a lot of times for an RFQ or RFP, um, the timeline can depend on how many stakeholders and how it affects the organization as a whole. But we'll get those back with the goal of having discussions of narrowing that supplier pool. Uh, maybe, so if you send it out for three, then uh, maybe, excuse me, if you send it out for five, then we'll narrow that down to one or two. Um, and we're looking for the best fit overall from the university, from a value standpoint, from a clinical standpoint, from a price standpoint, from a standardization standpoint. So those are some of the decision-making tools that we um, discuss as a team to decide what the best fit is. So we've narrowed it down to the best fit and um, I begin my final negotiations um, things that you want or don't want or things you want to see in addition. And I negotiate on your behalf, on the university's behalf, to get the best final contract, and then I execute it. Once I execute it, then you're good to go and have supplier conversations or meetings to decide next steps. But operationally, there's some other additional things that you need to do. So um, that usually is um, getting the supplier onboarded, getting them a supplier ID, figuring out or determining how they're going to invoice us so we have to pay them. So those are kind of the, the steps of the entire procurement process. And then after that, getting some sort of metrics or a KPI in place to, to determine how that vendor is performing, how that product is performing, a lot of feedback back and forth. In my opinion, a new supplier here doing a service probably takes about six to three months to onboard. 
Uh, we do things in a in an interesting way here, sometimes different, different out of the box in other organizations. So it's good to educate that supplier and give them a good onboarding. There are methods in which you can pay, and I've provided those for you. Um, so a lot of this information is going to be for your department administrator or your admin, but there are different ways to pay. So I've provided the payment methods that we accept at the University of Michigan. Um, that's continued on. One is your P-card. Your P-card, you cannot buy goods and services with your P-card, uh, but that's just a little note that sometimes that does happen. But most likely you'll be purchasing through an EPRO requisition through the system um, with those um, requisitions referencing the contract that I put in place for you. Um, there is people pay. Sometimes we do just pay a person for goods and services, not a supplier. Um, but your admin, your department admin, or your um, department leader will know best on how to pay. Some of your responsibilities are going to be listed on page six. Just a reminder, if anything has a signature on it, you unfortunately cannot sign on behalf of the Regents of the University of Michigan. So if there's no dollar value at all, but you're making some sort of commitment to a supplier, it also needs to come to the procurement office for us to review. Um, also, this is part of that requisition process, the second box monitor your orders or questions. Sometimes the supplier gets onboarded and they don't know anything. So it is your job to point that person, that supplier in the right direction on how to get paid, how to submit invoices, just another one of your responsibilities. And then the final one is just the shipping to a non-university location. Sometimes that happens. I don't necessarily think it would be the role of anybody, but I did include that here because sometimes it does happen. Um, invoicing is also your responsibility when you're not working with procurement. So I talked about that under $50,000 threshold. You can go and purchase under $50,000 annually, but you're going to have to figure out invoicing yourself. So sometimes it's better to come to procurement because we do a lot of that work for you. And then I also included restricted commodities. There are some restrictions that you cannot buy on your own. Um, most of them would be like medical, pharmaceuticals, hazardous waste type of products. But I also enlist, listed a restriction per, restricted purchases list for you, just so you know what you're not allowed to buy. Um, finally, on page seven, um, you guys are given some training. So if you want to learn more about procurement or want to take a class or you are the purchaser in your department, you'll want to take advantage of some of these easy training, onboarding that kind of gets you in the system and allows you to learn how it all works. And then finally, I or almost finally, I gave you some additional resources. The procurement guideline policy basically tells you what the policies and procedures are for the University of Michigan Med School and the campus location. So that's a good document if you're ever curious. It is a little cumbersome but it will give you a complete understanding of what's acceptable for procurement and not acceptable for procurement. Part of that document will also tell you the, the acceptable way to handle a supplier. You are free to talk to suppliers. You are free to get information and get educated from them, but business decisions your procurement agent should be brought in. Also, if you're having an issue with a supplier, say, hey, they're coming around, they didn't um, ask for a meeting first, you're just seeing them lurk in the hallways, always call procurement and we'll handle those supplier relationships for you. We don't want you to have to get involved or you may have relationships with them. You don't want to tell them. So you call me and I'll tell them. Um, and so I, I do manage the vendor relationships for you. You do not have to do that. Um, finally, on this is our address and our email. And then sometimes you'll be working with university procurement. Mostly when you deal with software, um, you'll be working with our technology team. So some of the software upgrades or new software, anything that has to do with um, IT, um, it goes to the procurement side of, of the house. Um, I really manage only goods and services. Also shared services, if you need accounts payable, have questions about how to, get an invoice or 
you know, to your supplier. I've listed that information and then I, HITS, which we all deal with, but they do some procurement functions, uh, mostly when it comes to that IT space, software, that kind of thing. I've listed their contact information. And then finally, uh, your team of procurement agents that are here, we are on Green Road. Uh, we can come to site if needed. Most people love Zoom now, so most of my meetings are via Zoom, but we're here to take a meeting with you or for you, um, especially on your behalf when it comes to negotiating a contract. Or if you just have questions or concerns, give us a call. We're happy to take an easy Zoom, or if you want to meet in person, we're happy to do that. So questions for contracts and procurement, I think you're going to put it in the chat and we'll discuss them later. But my contact information is there as well. And I hope to give this, this kind of guideline or this cheat sheet to you so that you'll have it's easy, it's easy to follow and you can follow up with questions. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, we have um, there's lots of questions coming, lots but I think we'll see. We'll, oh, great! We'll save them to the end. Oh. Um, next, uh, we have Pete Bryant, who's going to give us an inside look to the value analysis team at Michigan Medicine. Uh, he's going to talk about lots of different things, such as how do we standardize initiatives, the committee updates, how do we get new product request processes in place, and many many other. Uh, important issues um, when it comes to value analysis teams. So with that, uh, Pete. Great. Thank you, Dr. Mbari. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me today, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and, and talk. And uh, Carmen, thank you for that presentation. It's awesome. Um, I uh, Just by way of quick uh, introduction, uh, I've been in my role as the value analysis manager for just a little over two years. Uh, prior to that, um, I've been with uh, Michigan Medicine for a little over eight, eight and a half years, uh, and I held various positions within nursing. I was a clinical nurse, an educator, um, supervisor, and I worked in, in uh, quality and safety initiatives, um, but my background is primarily cardiac nursing, so I feel comfortable in this setting. Um, and prior to U of M, I did work for Trinity Health uh, in nursing as well. Um, today, I, I would really like to spend some time talking about sort of where we are with the value analysis program um, and where we would like to head in the future. Uh, so I have a couple slides here that I'm going to share. And I just want to make sure everyone can see those okay. All right. Um, so today's topic will be the clinically integrated supply chain and the value analysis process here at the University of Michigan. So I want to introduce um, just sort of a broad kind of broad stroke strategy for supply chain for the University of Michigan Health. Uh, we're in kind of a new day here with our integration with Sparrow and, and UMH West. And so we have to kind of consider how we're doing things um, from a value analysis standpoint uh, on a statewide on a statewide uh, sort of platform. Um, but our, our core mission is to ensure that clinicians have what they need to provide the highest level and highest quality of care to every patient when they need it. Um, we do this by establishing standardized decision-making mechanisms through our value analysis teams. Um, and we'll get into the structure of how those teams are organized across the state here in a little bit. Um, but we want to make sure that we're bringing in the best value that takes into consideration um, the highest standards of quality and safety, physician satisfaction, um, you know, data, evidence to support, and best pricing. Uh, how we do this is we utilize our value analysis teams in our strategic sourcing and contracting departments for physician preference items to achieve that best value. Uh, and we do that through these multidisciplinary reviews. Um, and decisions. As many of us know, um, after salaries and benefits, supplies and purchase services comprise approximately about 40% of healthcare costs. Um, so it's, you know, in a margin constrained uh, environment like, uh, like hospitals, it's becoming ever more important that we, you know, we really seek to, you know, get the best value out of the devices and services that we're, that we're purchasing. Um, you know, I strongly believe that success in the emerging healthcare market requires ongoing uh, interdisciplinary partnership between clinicians and supply chains um, because you need to balance the trade-offs of value and cost 
and these programs, any high functioning value analysis program should be clinically led with supply chain in a supportive role. Um, at the AMC, we have you know, various committees that are chaired by physicians, um, but they're staffed with a multidisciplinary group. We have nursing, we have infection prevention, uh, we have administrative leadership, we have contracts and procurement, other supply chain professionals, all on these committees that are reviewing uh, new products and new devices that are being requested to be introduced into the, into the facility. Uh, we work really closely with folks like Carmen and her department to facilitate the clinical aspects of a competitive bid process. So you, you can rest assured that you're getting the best value out of the, of the devices that you wish to bring in. And then we, we work that process all the way through warehouse operations to coordinate the product and equipment implementation so that you have it on the shelves how you want it and when you want it for um, for when your patients are are needing that. Um, if you look at the statewide value analysis structure, so for those who don't know, we did um, we acquired Sparrow last year, early last year, and with that, supply chain has been one of the departments that has been at the forefront of the integration process. Uh, this has by, been by no means a smooth journey so far. There's a lot of lessons that we're learning through this integration. Um, but what we're finding is that we are actually in a good position uh, currently with our current structures uh, to provide good statewide support for all the areas that are going to need our services. So on the left, you see that's that's the AMC. So when I refer to AMC, I'm referring to the Academic Medical Center in Ann Arbor. So UMH AMC has uh, five different VAT committees that we uh, that we facilitate here. Uh, you have a periop VAT, a med surge VAT, um, the interventional cardiology VAT, which Carmen was discussing, uh, the interventional radiology VAT, and also a separate electrophysiology VAT. In the middle, you'll see the structure for UMH Sparrow, and they and they cover all the identical areas, but they've consolidated their um, their interventional cardiology and their electrophysiology vat into a heart and vascular vat, but they still cover the same uh, same departments over there. And then all the way to the right, you'll see UMH West, much smaller. Um, they have a different structure, but they still have a couple vats that they facilitate each month. Um, and their surgical vat is is sort of anything that's not med surge commodities, not nursing centric. That rolls up to that vat, um, and they're able to um, you know accommodate any of the requests or reviews that are coming in from the various departments in that one single vat. Uh, like I said, much smaller. So what you can expect from a value analysis is that we we take every um, every request. And it's a, it, every request is unique. It has different uh, complexities, different nuances to it, but we follow a very set of standard processes to get, um, to get, to get a robust analysis teed up for a good conversation for the VATS. Um, kind of how we view our job is the best way I can describe it is we, we help the, the institution and the providers and the committee identify is the juice really worth the squeeze on any of these requests that are coming in. So we will always provide comprehensive responses to any inquiries or any needs. Um, we try to connect diverse interests from various facets of the organization. We do that by uh, ensuring that our committees are staffed in a multidisciplinary fashion. Uh, for instance, our monthly perioperative VAC committee routinely has anywhere between 30 and 40 people on. There's physician representation for, from all different subspecialties on there. And um, we really tend to have very robust clinical conversation about the evidence, the research, is this really gonna contribute to um, strategic and clinical outcomes that we're, we're seeking to achieve? And then lastly, we do benchmarking to ensure that, you know, if this is something that we wanna move forward with as an institution, uh, that we're definitely getting uh, the best pricing uh, that we deserve on that. Um, we also help, uh, you know, Carmen touched on, you know, vendor management and vendor relations. We do help facilitate some of that as well. Um, we, we really don't want our physicians and our nurses and our other clinicians being tied up in, in, in back and forth conversations with vendors and reps. That's, that's something that we do on behalf, uh, of the, on behalf of you for the organization. Um, and so we try to be proactive about getting that message out that if, you know, if there's conversations that need to be had please let us address the business side of things so that you can continue to focus on patients and we can, you know, we can really get to the heart of, uh, of the business decisions 
and then bring that information back to you so that you can be informed. All this is to say, uh, you know, everything starts with a new product request for value analysis. Um, there are times through other sourcing initiatives that decisions are made to, you know, switch vendors and maybe a category of implants. Um, but for, for specific devices and things like that, it all starts with a new request through value analysis. Um, kind of going back to our statewide uh, map right now, there are different processes at each site that, uh, that you go about initiating this product request. Our end goal is to get to a statewide standard tool for how these are submitted and ultimately get to a statewide sort of VAT structure so that we have good transparency to uh, you know, each other's formularies. What is each other using? Are we aligned on pricing? Are we getting the outcomes we need? Um, that's still a little ways away just with system limitations and all that, but we're, we're definitely making some good progress there. But it all starts out uh, with the new product requests. Here at the AMC, we have an electronic form that you fill out. And once that's completed, it goes into a database for us. And we have, you know, we have a running list of open projects. Um, and those get assigned to one of five um, analysts here at, at the AMC. And each analyst is assigned to a specific clinical area. Um, the turnaround time on these can can widely vary. I think industry best standards is if you can get uh, if you can get requests in from the date they're submitted to a date a VAT is decided either yes or no on that. Um, if you can get that under ninety days or less, that's that's pretty much the gold standard in the industry right now. However, many of these are accomplished much quicker than that. Um, really, the rate limiting factor how quickly we can address requests comes down to how thorough the information is uh, when it's submitted to us to reduce that back and forth, you know, seeking uh, additional information. And then, um, you know, availability of physicians to come present to that committees and just getting that calendared so that we can um, we can have that discussion at the VAC committee. Um, all of our committees at the AMC currently uh, do blind voting on each committee to determine whether something is going to be brought in or not. I would say, um, you know, if the if if value analysis is doing its due diligence and we're having good conversations that leading up to that VAC committee, there's very rare times that we would ever say no. You know, if if the if the uh, return on investment is there and and we try to capture all facets of that before we go to committee, if there's a really good case to be made. Um, you know, we very rarely have denied things. It usually would be for something like either the reimbursement was really bad and maybe we need to do a, um, a deeper dive into the reimbursement, how that's, you know, how it's billed, how it's coded. Um, or it just, you know, at this time, it's just cost prohibitive. Maybe it, there's a capital component that wasn't approved in this fiscal year budget. But as I said, those are those are pretty extenuating and, and we do have um, a very high rate of of approving new technology for institution. After all, this is, you know, this is an academic metal, medical center and we need to be on that kind of that tip of the spear with um, with technology and, and advancements. However, there are times where there are emergent needs um, for things to take care of patients that we don't have in our formula, or we don't have quick access to. There needs to be an avenue to, to bring those devices in that are patient specific, you know, emergent needs. So this is actually only a couple months old, but we've rolled out a new uh, a new form. It's an emergency single use request form. It's just a simple PDF form. Um, so if there if there's a need uh, to accommodate one of these circum one of these circumstances, um, we just ask that the a really kind of distilled version of the new product request is filled out. That way, I myself and a couple other people in supply chain can can review that make sure that there's uh, no issues with the vendor or no issues with the product itself. And, and so long as we have good information, we're able to turn these decisions around in a, in a very short period of time. I'm talking, you know, 24 to 48 hours. Um, so this is something that we've rolled out in the last couple of months that has been um, really effective at kind of streamlining that process. We've taken it off email. We've taken it off, um, you know, back and forth conversations and, it's really helped us make these expedited decisions, you know, to make sure that these patients are taken care of. Um, so I know I just said a lot and um, I'm looking forward to answering any questions, but I just want to say again, thank you for listening. Um, what I've learned in my, in my two years uh, in this role is that, um, you know, this process, the process of introducing new items into the institution has been 
um, a little confusing and not and not super well known by all the people that really need to know this. So uh, again, I just appreciate the opportunity to come and and uh, sort of share our program with you. And I look forward to sharing updates as they uh, as they're developed. So thank you. Thank you, Pete. Um, so our um, last speaker is Nicole Black, uh, who is the program director at MedTech Innovator. She grew up in Michigan. And unfortunately, we lost her to Boston University to, and she went there to study um, biomedical engineering. Um, um, in 2002, she completed her um, PhD at Harvard uh, University, working with um, lots of different interdisciplinary medtech uh, projects between the Weiss Institute for Biologically Inspired Engineering and Mass Eye and Ear Hospital. Um, after graduating, Nicole, um, as one does, started her own company, um, a startup called Beacon Bio, based on her PhD work um, as a Gilly Healthcare Innovation Scholar. Following Beacon Bio's acquisition by Desktop Metal, Nicole uh, served as the vice president of uh, vice president of biomaterials and innovations in desktop desktop metal health division. Um, she has lots of accolades uh, that she's received through her career, um, some of which include collegiate inventors competition graduate winner in two thousand and eighteen. And the Lemis and MIT Student Prize in 2021 and MIT Technology Review Innovators on their 35 2023. And she is um, in her role at, at, as, as in MedTech Innovator, she, uh, she um, talks to many different institutions and startups. And she's here to kind of tell us a little bit about MedTech Innovator and how that may be a good option for a lot of our uh, startups that are coming out of Michigan. Great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Dr. Gambari. And um, thank you to you and Ashley for organizing this series. And great to hear the insight from Carmen and Pete before this as well. Um, that was really helpful to you guys. I will try to keep this quick because I know you guys got a lot of really good questions in the chat. I want to make sure there's time for that. Um, but yeah, as Dr. Gambari mentioned, um, so I am the program director for the U.S. program here at MedTech Innovator. Um, we have three flagship programs under the MedTech Innovator umbrella. So our U.S.-based MedTech Innovator program, which I run, uh, we also have an APAC version. So if you are anyone else is looking to market and sell your device in the Asia Pacific region, um, uh, look up that program. And then finally, if uh, anyone is working on a B2B life science tool company, um, instead of a med device diagnostic company, feel free to look up our BioTools Innovator Program um, as well. So i um, excited to share a bit about this today. And we actually just opened up our applications for our new cohort on Monday. So this is very timely. Um, and so, yeah, looking forward to uh, telling you guys about it. So MedTech Innovator is the industry's largest nonprofit um, global competition and accelerator for medical device, digital health, and diagnostic companies. Um, so unlike some programs where, you know, they're just an accelerator uh, with mentorship and um, courses, things like that, or those that are just, you know, one-time competition that you show up for, we're really everything combined. So uh, our program itself is about a five-month program that runs from June to October each year. And um, at the end of it, it'll culminate in, uh, we have six different um, competitions for prize money at the end. Um, we've grown pretty substantially over the years uh, and now have 717 alumni companies that have been through the MedTech Innovator Program. And, you know, unlike the statistic that you hear a lot with, you know, 90 to 95% of startups, you know, going out of business um, at some point, 96% of our companies are still in business or have been acquired. So great track record there. Um, and these companies have gone on to raise um, almost nine billion dollars in follow-on equity funding as well so this is not counting all of the grants and non-dilutive sources they get um, this has led to 48 acquisitions so medtech products actually uh, impacting the world um, with 350 products on the market and 351 um, fda approvals or clearances um, so uh, really a great, uh, you know, track record of companies that have been through this. Um, but, you know, what what types of companies are, are eligible for MedTech Innovator? So um, on our website, uh, we have a list of strategic interest areas, um, if you want to look that up. But really anything that classifies as a medical device, a diagnostic, or digital health. Um, so especially in the digital health space, um, I get a lot of questions on if things are relevant. Um, but if you're creating a physical device, I would say probably, you know, some of our most common 
applicants are creating, you know, an implantable device or maybe a diagnostic device that interfaces uh, with the body. Um, so a lot in the cardiology space for diagnostics as well. Um, interventional tools, tissue graphs, safety mechanisms, things like that. Um, but on the digital side as well, uh, we support companies that are in consumer healthcare. Um, so we uh, actually, our best video prize winner was a company called Oslo that is creating sleep buds um, that actually uh, play certain frequencies and are comfortable to um, help you sleep better and are now in a clinical trial for um, tinnitus as well. So um, they're trying to reach into medical uh, indications. So if you're working on more of a consumer good, but it does impact health, uh, definitely don't discount this. Um, workflow optimization as well. Um, so we've had several companies go through that try to make jobs easier for all of the great surgeons that um, you're going to be working with and, and selling your products to um, imaging technologies and also measurement assessments. So um, wide range of things that we accept into the program. Um, and what do you actually get if you um, are accepted into the program? So first of all, you'll be part of a uh, intense educational curriculum that we custom tailor to uh, whatever the cohort's interests are that year. Um, so we have webinars every single week on topics including uh, reimbursement and um, regulatory needs, uh, manufacturing, commercialization, M&A, um, and we bring in uh, experienced speakers as well as alumni that have been through the program to share their experiences. Um, in a minute, I'll also talk about our value program. Um, so we were very lucky to have Dr. Gambari as a facilitator in that program. That's how we connected. Um, and so you'll be working, you know, with experts. So, you know, think, you know, folks, you know, like Carmen and Pete, uh, we don't have them in the program yet, but would love to, to get them in um, on crafting your value proposition. In addition to that, we um, offer direct mentorship. So we partner with about a dozen uh, corporate strategic partners, including Johnson & Johnson, MedTech, um, Edwards Life Sciences, big in the cardiology space. Um, also WL Gore, which does a lot of vascular graphs, uh, mentorship, uh, Dexcom, BD, Olympus, Zimmer, uh, Nipro, um, uh, list, list goes on. And each um, early stage company in our cohort gets at least one corporate mentor from one of these organizations, as well as one um, service provider mentor that can help you with, um, you know, putting together a clinical study plan or a marketing plan um, and uh, help guide you through uh, that, those uh, the five months of the accelerator program. Um, additionally, we uh, offer recognition and visibility. So we have a very active LinkedIn. If you're not following MedTech Innovator on LinkedIn yet, really encourage you to um, do that now. Uh, we have a fantastic visibility for all of our companies through competitions. So for example, at the MedTech conference or AdvaMed in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had all of our companies on a showcase panel moderated by one of uh, our partners. Community. So I think this is um, the number one thing that our cohort uh, says each year they take away from this. In the med tech space, um, you know, I'm from Michigan. I think it's even worse than Boston finding other folks um, that, that are in this uh, ecosystem and going through these challenges. Um, here in Boston, for example, we have a lot of biotech and therapeutics companies. Um, people assume bio med tech, um, but it's really hard to find others that are going through these challenges. Often, you know, steep regulatory hurdles, manufacturing hurdles, and in, in considerations, um, but not with the same level of VC funding as a lot of these other biotech companies. So being part of this peer network with others that are going through the same thing um, uh, is really strong. And we uh, will assign each uh, member of the cohort into a pod uh, where they can connect with other like-minded CEOs on a regular basis. Um, we have a variety of networking events um, for even beyond the program. Um, so, for example, each year, some of our alumni companies will pitch at device talks, um, and uh, we have a very strong um, investor network as well. Other resources that you'll get, um, so partnering opportunities. Um, we have exclusive, you know, lists we'll put together for these different events. Um, each of our companies will also work with a PhD student fellow on a project that's about 20 hours um, where you can have them uh, help you do uh, market research. So uh, we have pitch book access that uh, will give our companies and fellows to help with that um, or other, you know, customer research you might need. Uh, also, each uh, company that goes through the program gets a year complimentary membership to Advomed Excel. Um, so great uh, opportunity to, you know, uh, 
have an impact on the med tech space and they really like to hear from you know our startups on on what uh what what is coming next um, in the med tech world and then finally and this is the one you know people mostly care about but um i think uh some of the others are some of the the, the more more of the value but the funding of course so we give out over eight hundred thousand dollars in non-dilutive prize funding um each year between as i mentioned six different competitions um so our grand prize winner this year was semi uh respiratory diagnostic technology using acoustic waves um, for COPD diagnosis. Uh, she walked away with a $350,000 check, um, completely non-dilutive. Um, we don't take you know any equity in your company to even participate in the program. Um, it's all funded by our sponsors. So um, great opportunity there. And as I mentioned, um, you know Paul Grand, our CEO, comes from a uh, VC background um, with uh, RCT. And this is um, how MedTech Innovators spun out. He is very well connected in the investor space, makes intros all the time, helps with pitch coaching. So great um, opportunity there. And we also just launched, um, we have our Innovator Portal where our cohort can connect and also list information about their currently open round um, that gets publicized to investors um, to, to reach out to you. So um, th that's just a bit of it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, one of the great things is the ecosystem. So all of these um, partners that we have, uh, we also have three specialty tracks. So a lot of you guys might be interested in the um, heart and brain track uh, sponsored by the American Heart Association. Um, so in addition to the regular MTI program, you get a bonus, um, you get to give you mentor by the AHA. You also get to go to their conference and um, showcase there. Uh, we also have a military track if any of your uh, app, uh, your technologies are relevant to, to military applications and a plastic surgery track. So definitely um, when you're completing the application, you can check those boxes off um, if those are of interest to you. Um, and then, so, uh, you know, really uh, why I'm joining here today is because uh, we offer this value program, as I mentioned. So all of our cohort companies are invited to participate in this intensive um, special program throughout the MTI program, where uh, you're really assessing uh, what is your value proposition and looking at it through the lenses of all the different stakeholders. Um, so often, you know, as I have a science engineering background, um, it's, you know, intuitive for us to think of, you know, what the benefits might be for the patient or sometimes the service. Surgeon, um, but you know these other stakeholders. So the payers, the hospitals, um, you know the folks, you know like Carmen and Pete that are going to be analyzing, you know your technologies if they're going to be, you know implemented in the healthcare system. What value are they seeing out of it? Uh, so we really go through an intensive deep dive first, um, a workshop that we have uh, where all of our companies participate, and we have 52 facilitators um, through this guiding you um, in completing a value worksheet um, uh, where you will look at these different stakeholders and what evidence you want to generate for them. Um, and then we have a, a more intensive value coaching program that you can opt into. And about 90% of our companies this year did opt into more intensive value coaching um, based on those experiences. So um, at the end of this, uh, this will culminate in our value competition where we give out a $25,000 check uh, to whichever company um, has best represented their value proposition. So great um, feature and uh, yeah, really important for startups to uh, consider, you know, all of these different stakeholders in order to get um, adoption in the market. And it's never too early to start thinking about this, um, especially, you know, the healthcare economics involved. If you have a truly innovative tech technology that doesn't fit in an existing box. Uh, doesn't have an existing CPT code maybe, um, and how you can demonstrate this to the value analysis committee um, down the road. And so what does this uh, timeline look like coming up? So um, we just launched our applications, as I mentioned. The deadline will be January 15th, um, but the earlier you can get it in, the better. Um, that should actually say 2025. It's next year now. Um, and then we are going to have our uh, road to our pitch events. Uh, so this is going to happen between March and May. We usually have one in um, D.C. and L.A. So you guys are kind of in the middle. You can decide which of those you know, you'd know you like to go to. We also have one in Dublin um, where you'll go in person. Also great networking opportunity. Um, we make announcements in late May of the uh, who we're actually selecting for this. And then we have our um, Innovator Summit uh, in June, where uh, all of our companies come together, meet in person, meet our partners, network, uh, learn new things as well. Um, as I mentioned, the Accelerator program runs from June to October, and then will culminate at um, the MedTech Conference, which next year is in San Diego in October. So um, we'll be great to you know have those competitions. And everyone always says that the summit and the showcase at the end are some of their favorite parts of the program. 
Um, so overall, this is, you know, what it looks like. It is um, a very competitive program. Um, as I mentioned, it's really, you know, like the Harvard of uh, medical accelerators uh, with about a 5% admit rate. So we get, you know, somewhere uh, between 1,000, 2,000 applications each year, invite about 200 companies to pitch at our road tours, and then select 65 for our cohort um, that are split between early stage companies, which anywhere from, you know, you're still in academia, maybe you've raised, you know, uh, you have a SBIR grant or some other, you know, translational grant through the institution, all the way to have raised about 15 million or so in equity funding. And then our mid-stage companies have generally raised about 15 million or more, often our clinical st stage or um, commercial stage. And so if you're interested, um, here's a QR code you can um, scan or you can just, you know, Google MedTech Innovator application it will bring you to our website. Um, we're also having an info session on Monday. Um, you guys, you know, heard the basics now, but uh, we're going to be going in more detail about the program and have a Q&A session. Uh, we're also having our uh, winner from this year um, joining as well uh, to share her insights on the program and uh, her advice for making the most of it. So if you want to um, join that info session, um, on Monday, um, scan that link there. Um, I believe it's at uh, 9 a.m. Pacific, um, 12 Eastern, so same time slot as this. Um, so definitely scan that. Um, I'll leave those up for a second, but um, thank you guys so much um, and really appreciate you guys having me. Um, hope to see some of you in the program next year and um, feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat if you guys have any questions after the fact. Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Nicole. And I can't um, say enough about the MedTech Innovator Program, their value program. It's um, one of its kind, and it's definitely a, you know, a huge value. If you can participate and apply, it would be a big win for you and your company, anybody who can get in. You know, it's pretty competitive, but it's a wonderful program. Um, okay, so um, I think we can dive into the questions here. Um, I want to maybe start the questions off, but... You know, there's been a bunch of questions in the chat and I'll try to summarize them. This question would be for Pete. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what it is that um, you're looking at? Um, you know, particularly give us, give us an idea about like what kind of clinical data you're looking for uh, when, you're, when you're doing your value analysis and what kind of economic data you're looking for. Do you use literature or do you do some, you know, back of the napkin calculation when you're doing your stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, really, when we get a when we get a, a request or, you know, can we look at bringing something new in, whether it's, you know, an advance in technology of a device we already have, or if it's a brand new device that could be, you know, assisting with procedures we don't currently do here. Um, we the first quick, you know, little, you know, formula that we do is, you know, what is the operational cost of, of what we're using with all our current utilization in the current state, and then whether the new item is going to partially replace or completely replace, whatever the circumstances are, we just show what the future state operational cost is. That that is the first, I guess, number that we crunch to see. You know, what is what is the cost analysis of this? That's just one component. Um, associated with each request is, you know, we ask on we ask of each requester, what are the strategic benefits of this? Um, is it going to improve clinical outcomes? You know, what are the white papers associated with it? A lot of this comes out organically in the conversations that take place on the VAT calls themselves. Um, but some examples, you know, could be, does it decrease procedural time? Does it reduce length of stay? Um, you know, does it uh, improve sepsis outcomes? Does it reduce, you know, hospital acquired infections or pressure injuries? Does it aid in improving the clinical, out clinical outcomes? And if it maybe doesn't have a huge impact in clinical outcomes, does it facilitate the procedure itself for the physician? So it doesn't make um, does it make performing the case easier? Um, can we can we leverage shifting vendors in this space to get better pricing? So some of that is like a strategic uh, decision. Like if we move away from this vendor who maybe offers something um, equivalent, but it's a it's a competitive device. Can we drive more value doing that? Oftentimes, we we find that we can we can maybe do that as well, um, and and all this is considered um, when making that final vote on the VAT committees. We try to have all that come out naturally on the on the calls themselves, so that anybody who is a voting member is uh, having a complete picture. 
um, where, where is the economic data coming here? Um, do you, does that, you know, are you looking some sort of like a formalized paper that, that did, you know, sensitivity analysis and economic analysis, or are you mostly doing like, this is the CPT code, that's how much you get reimbursed if you do 20 times, you know, whatever CPT code. You know, um, do you, do you well, do that or like we do? Know, we do on some on some of the requests when we want to take a deeper dive on the return on investment. We will um, connect with our revenue uh, revenue cycle departments to 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 do more of a reimbursement analysis on that. Typically, we don't check that for every request. Usually, more of like the higher dollar operational impacts that that kind of triggers us to say, well, let's look at the reimbursement on this because if if the cost of the device is is going up, but the CPT codes are not being updated to reflect that. The revenue, you know, shrinks, obviously, if we're not getting compensated anymore. Now, there are sometimes new technology add-on payments that are subject to things that that do offer an additional uh, reimbursement payment for new technology. Um, but that list of that list of items that is subject to that is, is relatively small. Um, but some of the metrics we look at, we do some benchmarking, we, we use Vizient, we use ECRI and others to, to look at the price index of what we're being quoted on um, to try to, you know, use that to our negotiating power. Like, you know, this is, you know, this is not what we expect. We would expect better pricing on this. Um, I don't personally get into a lot of the negotiating details. That would be something that Carmen does, but, um, but we do bring that to discussion. And then, you know, is there an ability to, if we're bringing something else in, can we reduce the utilization of other things that are already in the formulary so that we don't have, you know, redundant devices being used? Um, a lot of a lot of what VA does too is look at utilization reviews, and and we try to standardize um, standardize where we can. Thank yeah, that's that's super helpful. So so for you know a startup coming to you. Di directly or I guess this question would be for Carmen do you do you often see a company coming to you directly or this relationship is mediated through a faculty champion at the University of Michigan general yeah um in the past I would have suppliers come to me directly um usually I give that to the position um chair champion and that person decides if they want to take it to that also, if I have relationships with suppliers, so for cardiology specific, there are four suppliers that we primarily use. They'll tell me about new products that are coming up, um, and then I'll just say, hey, this has to go for that approval, and it goes that way. But usually, I would prefer a request to come from internally than externally, just to make sure that it's something we really want and something that's not being pushed on us to look at. But yeah, it can come either way. You gave me a funny no. face. What what was that? <laughs> no, no, no. I um I, I just um I, I I can imagine that your inbox is like bombarded with like oh, yeah. you know company uh you know requests for evaluations. So um Generally, though, I think it seems like the best way forward is if, if the product is is valuable and a physician would want to really use it, that seems like the, the most ideal way for a product to come through the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us a sense of like, you know, the, particularly when it comes to digital health products, there is um, oftentimes a need for demoing the product before you purchase the product. So how do you go about like evaluating a demo versus like a product that you're going to purchase like, you know, long term? You know, I'm going to let you have that one because I have one answer and you have another. <laughs> um, you know, if it's, a, if it's, if it's getting like samples in or something like that and, and there's, there's demonstrations and we're not, we're not asking to evaluate it in a clinical setting. Um, you know, we can, we can facilitate workshops or, or things to have things demoed. We typically would partner with a clinical department or a clinical champion who can help facilitate that. When it comes to requesting to actually evaluate new devices, um, we process that the exact same way we would if it were actually a new product request, not wanting to evaluate it. Um, we would tee it up, though, for the committees to say, this is a new product coming to market. 
you know, let's say the Department of Electrophysiology wants to do a trial on this, we just ask that the trial terms and conditions be outlined, you know, in detail so that we can go in with eyes wide open. We know that this is going to be a 12 case trial over three months. Um, and the evaluation forms that we would ask the clinicians to fill out are predetermined. So as soon as they're done performing a case, they can fill that form out. And then once the, the term of the evaluation is complete, we would then bring it back to the VAC committee again to do a report out. Um, more times than not, you know, I do find that people do like um, they do like the equipment during the evaluation. And then we and then we look at what the overall um, you know, financial and outcomes picture is going to be to bring that on in a in a long term fashion. Um, but the evaluations are are approved by the committees as well. Now, I will say that um, there are times where we can facilitate no co no cost evaluations. So that again would go to our contracts and procurement team. There's usually a trial agreement where the terms and conditions are laid out, um, and we just have people review that. It needs to be signed just like any other agreement. Um, and so long as the evaluation is meeting the conditions of that, you know, the, the university doesn't actually have to, to pay for the cost of the equipment during the evaluation. But again, that would be, um, that would have to go through an approval process as well. Thank you. There's a question for Nicole. I think it, it uh, says that for MTI, does the technology need to have already existed, exited the university and be inside a startup company before they apply? Yeah, good question. So um, if you're going to accept prize money at the end, you will require be required to be incorporated. Um, we generally uh, tell companies um, to only apply if they're incorporated um, as if uh, exited the university and have signed, you know, um, your uh, licensing agreement. Um, that does not need to be the case. Um, you can uh, still be working on your licensing agreement. In fact, two of our companies are currently, you know, finalizing their licensing agreements now in the current cohort. Um, but uh, yeah, you should at least have, you know, a, a website, um, your own name. So it can't just be like, you know, University of Michigan lab of, you know, Dr. Gambari spin out. Um, you have to have a, a venture um, uh, and, you know, a, a mission around that. And you have to have one person dedicated to the program that can participate um, throughout the year, including um, someone had asked in the chat, which is a good question, if they need to relocate. No, it's completely virtual, except for um, the three in-person events I talked about. Um, so you can join from wherever, no need to relocate. But um, I would expect um, uh, you usually spend around three to five hours a week between our webinars, mentoring sessions, coaching um, and things like that uh, throughout the program. So someone needs to be able to dedicate time to that. Um, but great question. Um, we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you so much for you know, very interesting and insightful um, webinar here. Um, you know, if you have any questions, please reach out to me, or Ashley. If, if there are companies here, outside of Michigan who want to also engage with us, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to talk with you and you know discuss the details of procurement value analysis at Michigan further. And if you can, please, definitely, I highly recommend applying to MedTech Innovator. Fantastic, one-of-a-kind program. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you for, to Thanks our later. presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you.